going on. Um, my name is Romeo, I'm the Citizen Science Coordinator for the Key Biscayne Community Foundation Citizen Science Project. Uh, today uh, we have Dream and Green here um, hosting one of their WE Labs, which is a water energy uh, conservation uh, workshop. Um, they also have uh, representatives from Miami Day Water and Sewer and, and Solid Waste uh, to talk to you about the different recycling programs and, and other things that uh, they have going on, just so you have a better understanding of, of how everything works. Um, you'll notice that on the chairs there is a survey. Um, one of the, the ways that we get funding for all the programming we do is through grants and uh, donations. Uh, the, for the past two years, we've been working on an e, off an EPA grant for environmental education. And using that, we gave a sub-grant to Dream and Green so that they could host a couple of their WE Labs here on the key. Um, in order to submit our reports to the EPA, we need to find out how the audience is doing, what they're learning, what they're thinking. And so we would really appreciate it if you could fill out these surveys at the end of the presentation and turn them back into us. Um, I have a bunch of pens, I'll hand those out towards the end. Um, also, once you hand in your survey, uh, Alexandra has a toolkit for water and energy savings that she will give you, um, but you have to fill out the survey. <laughs> All right, and with that, I will hand it off to Alexandra. Thank you. So thank you so much for coming, guys, on the Saturday to hear us talk. Um, like you said, my name is Alexandra, and I work with Dream and Green. And Dream and Green is a Miami-based nonprofit who focuses on environmental education. So what we do is we host um, workshops and programs around the community, teaching people about environmental sustainability. So We Lab is one of Dream and Green's programs, and it stands for the Water Energy Learning Behavior. And what we do is we host these workshops around the community, teaching people about the water energy nexus and your impact in the environment. Um, if anybody registered before, this is the, our website. I encourage you to visit it afterwards as well. Most of the information you're going to be getting here today is on there, so it's an easy tool for you to use. Um, just a little bit of our impact so far. We do also have a school program in about 60 schools, and we are in a couple schools on this game as well. And so far we've hosted about 75 workshops, and this has allowed us to reach over 2,200 households in just in Miami Dade. So what we're going to be talking about today, like I said, is the water energy nexus, its impacts on the environment, the benefits of water energy conservation for the environment, as well as um, on your pockets and your utility bills, and some ways that you can implement and track the uh, conservation. So I keep talking about the nexus, and I'm just going to quickly explain what that is. In the simplest way, water and energy are connected. It takes significant amount of water to create energy to power your home, and vice versa, it takes a lot of energy to, uh, to provide you with clean drinking water. So this is just a little graphic on how that works. So you can see how we use water for energy. About half the water that we pump out of the ground is used to cool power plants to bring electricity to your home. And so also we use um, water to extract uh, natural gases and oils as well. That's also a form of, of power. And we also use water in the form of renewable energies, most likely uh, hydropower. So on the other side, you can see how we use energy for water. It takes a lot of energy to pump water out of the ground, to make that water clean and drinkable for you, to bring that water to your home for you to use it, and then once you're done with it, to remove it and treat it again and put it back. So this is just kind of a breakdown of what kind of, how much water you use every day. In the simplest way, to think about it is that each individual person in this room uses about 100 gallons of water every single day. So just as a visual, you're all using 100 of these every single day. Every time you, you know, turn on your lights, flush your toilet, wash your clothes, it's 100 gallons of water every single day. And when you think about the amount of people that live just here, like in this country and then also in South Florida, Miami has about 2.6 million people and that population is only rising. People want to come down here, we have this lovely weather going on here, but all these new people are using the same source. So 2.6 million people are all using 100 gallons of water every single day. And we all know that water is a limited resource, that we only have a certain amount on the planet for us to use. Less than 1% of water on Earth is clean, drinkable, fresh water for us to use. So it's something you have to think about when you're using that much water every single day. So I'm going to have Patrick come up, and he's going to talk about where the water here comes from. Can everybody hear me without the microphone? Yeah. Yes. OK, I'm gonna, if you don't mind, I'm going to the Just a little easier. Good afternoon. So my name is I'm Patrick from Miami Dade Water and Sewer Department. I'm the water use efficiency manager. So my job is to actually uh, educate people on our water resources here in Miami Dade County, which we have a very, very unique 
plentiful source of water at this time. And so my job is to educate people on water, uh, the water resources and actually promote water conservation. Uh, we have a plan, the county has a water conservation plan that I'm implementing to try to reduce the amount of, people, amount of water that people use. So, um, so that's what I'm gonna talk about. So uh, let's see, so as uh, Alexandra was saying, Miami-Dade County, we're actually the largest, uh, most populated county in the state of Florida. Anybody have an idea where the population of the state is now? Mm -hmm. uh, as a state? Is it 8 million? No, this is the whole state. Yeah. No, it's way more than that. <laughs> yeah, we actually just made it to the third most populous state in the country. We just surpassed New York State. Wow. We are 20 million people in, in the state of Florida. Wow. Yeah. You surpassed right? New York? We just surpassed New York. New York was, it was uh, California, Texas, New York, and Florida just edged out New York in population. So we are growing, and uh, we're growing at about 1,000 people per day, which is about the size of the city of Tampa per year. So we are on a growth spur, and we have limited water resources. Now I'm talking about the whole state, but of course in Miami-Dade County, anybody have any idea where our water comes from in Miami-Dade County? Uh, it's so funny, everybody says Lake Oak, so, but you're, you're partially correct. The ground. But for the major majority of our water comes from the Biscayne Island. Oh, gosh. Yeah, which is right under our feet. Um, so anyway, as a summary, as far as Miami-Dade Water and Sewer Department goes, we're the largest utility in the county. We serve about 2.3 million people. There are a number of other utilities in the, in the county, uh, but they small, uh, serve a very small portion. And for the most part, we probably sell the bulk water to those utilities, and then they distribute it to their residents. So we produce the bulk of the water that people use when you turn the tap on, put on the shower, flush your toilet. So we're a really big utility. We're one of the bigger departments in the county. Um, we have about 2,600 people that work in the department, and we have a budget of about $730 million. It's a big, um, big organization, a lot going on. Um, there's a lot we have to do. Uh, we're kind of out of sight, out of mind, for the most part, right? Most people don't think about us when you put your water on and you flush your toilet, and that's actually a good thing. All our pipes are underground, so you don't see them. And if everything's working great, then we're all very happy. It's only when there's a problem, we'll say. Right, right. It becomes really, it becomes very important. So, Alexandra makes a really good point. There's a, a connection, and most people don't realize, between water and energy. So, I don't know if you're aware of it, but Miami-Dade Water and Sewer Department, when we produce water, we use a lot of energy. You know, just think about, we have to pump the water out of the ground, then we treat it as a plant, and then we have to distribute it throughout the whole county. And it's a huge county, and we live in a flat area, so we don't have the benefit of gravity. So we have pumps, hundreds and hundreds of pumps that move water all over the place, distributing it to your home. Think about Key Biscayne in particular, right? Look how far away you are from the mainland. Yes. From where your water comes from, that water has to be pumped all the way here to Key Biscayne. So they have several pumps along the way to keep that water moving. It uses a lot of energy. Unfortunately, it creates a lot of greenhouse gases. So our job is to educate you on that so that for every gallon of water that you save and conserve, you're actually reducing the amount of energy that's being utilized. And that, in turn, is reducing pollution that's being created, contributing to um, uh, 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 what do you call it? So climate change, which in turn has dramatic effects for a place like Miami County. There's no climate change. Yeah. Well, you know, let's just say that, let's just say, I think we could all agree that there is sea level rise. Yeah. Now, why that's happening, that's, well, we, that's the political side, but that is a fact. You know, we have sea level rise that's occurring. We have gauges out in the bay and out at areas, locations in the, in the uh, ocean that are monitoring the sea level, and it is increasing. And it's, it's, it's increasing, and that's a dramatic effect on Langdon County because we're a low lying county, but right on the coast, and so hurricanes have a dramatic impact on us, right? Particularly a place like Key Biscayne. You guys are like, oh, you're ground zero for sea level rise. So just keep that in mind about the, the waste, I mean, the water and energy connection, and that another reason why it's important to conserve water. You'll also be reducing your energy use. Um, there's just some factoids about uh, how much energy we use. But getting back to the basics. So this is the basics. This is our, if you would take a knife and cut South Florida in half, this is what you would see. So you have all of the, have the ocean here, and this is the beach communities, and uh, all the you know, cities and communities and, and suburban growth growing, going westward and out towards the Everglades. And for the most part, the Biscayne Aquifer is very shallow. It's only, um, actually, it's, it's up to, uh, you guys, does anybody here have, um, live in a home that has irrigation? Like sprinklers? Yeah, yeah. Irrig a sprinkler yeah. system in their yard. 
Do you, where do you get your water from? That? Are you getting people like a shallow well? Sewer. Are you paying city water? Wow. Okay, so you're paying for that. That's expensive. And it's probably going to reduce my spring. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, well, if you're paying for it, you're probably not going to use it that much, which is smart. But many places out in the uh, suburbs, they they just drill a shallow well. They don't have to pay for the water. The aquifer is that shallow. You literally go down 10, 15 feet, and you get water. And that's the Biscayne Aquifer. That's the upper part of the Biscayne Aquifer. But for the most part, our water comes from like 80 to 100, 300 feet down. Uh, so that's basically what it looks like. And so um, you have the Everglades out here. So Lake, getting back to Lake Okeechobee. So this is primarily, this kind of is primarily rainfall driven. We, we rely on rainfall 100%. So if everything's typical in a typical year, we get about 55 inches of rain in the area. And so for the most part, that's enough to replenish our aquifer. So we have a healthy uh, water supply. The only problem is we rely on rainfall. And we never know when it's going to rain. In a typical year, we get 55 inches, but some years we may get a little bit less, and some years we may get more. So if we enter into a drought, it's a significant impact on our resource, and that's why it's very important to conserve it, because even though at this time it's plentiful, we never know we're going to enter into a drought. And with climate change, droughts are predicted to become more common. Um, yeah, so that's what, the, so that's what our uh, area looks like with the, with the Biscayne Aquifer. And this is actually a chunk of what the aquifer looks like. It's just a basically, it's limestone, it's very porous, porous very permeable, and um, water flows very freely, freely through there. And uh, it's interesting because our aquifer is, is managed by the state of Florida. So uh, Miami-Dade County has to apply for a permit from the state in order to withdraw that water from the Biscayne. So as time is going on, our population continues to grow, so we have to keep on asking for more and more water. And at some point, there's a limit that we're allowed to um, to get from the state as far as the allocation goes, and that's where water conservation comes in. That's where we have to try to educate people and say, hey, you know, we're reaching that upper max, please start reducing the amount of water you use, just be more conscious of it. Miami-Dade County, the average use of water is 140 gallons per person per day. I know, Alexander, you said 100. 100 gallons is the average throughout the country, but in Miami-Dade County, it's 140 gallons per person per day. It's a lot, and that's finished water. That's not um, outdoor water coming from. Yeah, so we want to get that number down because uh, that's not actually sustainable for the, the long-term growth predictions that there are in the county. That that's not a sustainable number. So so that's my job is to get out there and educate people about reducing their water use. Um, some of the issues that the aquifer we, we contend with is um, there can be contamination of the aquifer since it's so shallow. Any type of activity, human activity on the surface, can dramatically affect the aquifer directly. Um, over pumping, that's historically that's something we've done. As the county was growing, we were, we were over pumping and taking too much water out. And being a coastal community, when you take the water out, any idea what your thoughts are? If you're taking the first water out of the aquifer, something must come in and take its place. Any idea who has what that would be? So, so salt water. water, right? Because we're right here next to the ocean. So there's this constant battle between the freshwater aquifer and the ocean, the salt water. And you don't want to take out too much fresh water because if you do, then salt water moves right in and that's contamination and that's very difficult to reverse. So we're really trying to keep this, this aquifer healthy, particularly in light of climate change and all the issues that we have dealing with here with sea level rise. The idea is to try to keep that fresh water balance uh, there so we maintain a healthy aquifer. And that's a big challenge for us in Miami-Dade County in light of climate change and sea level rise. Um, so, you know, um, what, what are the issues that the utility confronts? Well, as you, we're a really big utility, and as I mentioned, being a coastal community, we have a really big challenge with sea level rise. And I'm going to repeat this over and over again because it is a huge issue here. And the predictions for what the, what the sea level rises are in the future are quite significant. And so as a utility, we have to prepare for that. If you think about it, I'm sure you're familiar with the water, wastewater treatment plant that's on Virginia Key. Yes. Right here on the way when you're driving out. So 50 or 60 years ago, I'm not sure how old that facility is. It's probably at least 50 years old, if not more. But it seemed like a good idea to put it there, right? Because there weren't that many people. And when you treat the water, where does the water go when we treat it? You discharge it out to the ocean. So we put a plant as close to the ocean as we could. Problem is, 50 or 60 years ago, we never thought about sea level rise. We never thought it was going to happen. There was no thought about it. Now it's a significant issue. So what do you do with that plant, right? I mean. Now you have the water creeping up, 
and uh, it's affecting the facility. So our, as a utility, we have to, they call it hard, we have to harden the facility. We have to actually build it up now in light of sea level rise. So that's an example of some of the issues that the utility is uh, confronting. Also, pipes underground, saltwater contamination has a tendency to affect the pipes. Those have to be replaced periodically. So there's a lot of challenges that are, that are happening. Um, obviously, population growth and, and serving all these additional people coming in and making sure they have a uh, sufficient supply of water. And so that's why water conservation is a huge issue for the county because in order to be sustainable, we've got to reduce our water use to make sure that aquifer can provide water to us into the future. Uh, this is kind of a, a little graphic. So my, uh, my spiel about constantly talking about saltwater intrusion, this is a very simple graphic. I'm not sure if it's going to work. So as you can see, with salt water, if you take out too much, if you keep on pumping too much water out of the freshwater aquifer, and you're not careful about what you're doing. Um, yeah, you can see, you see, you see that salt water freshwater line interface. It's actually moving westward, and then what happens? It contaminates the freshwater wells. So that's an example of the issues that we're confronting in Miami-Dade County. So um, that's what we don't want to happen. It's already been happening. That's my phone. It'll eventually stop. Sorry. <laughs> um, I thought it was the background. <laughs> yeah, and so uh, this is a big issue that we're confronting in the county. Uh, let's see. So what can you do? Right? So bring it down to the local level. Behavior is a big issue, right? Individual people's behavior goes a long way. What you do on a daily basis has a huge impact on the environment. For example, today, I live in Brickell, right? So I don't know, how far is it away from here? Eight Seven, eight miles, right? So I had a choice. I woke up this morning and I said, okay, I can either take my car, you know, drive down the 10 floors on the, the parking garage and then drive to keep escape, come here, or I can ride my bike. And I said, okay, you know what? That's not an easy choice because it's hot out. You know, I gotta work. I gotta, but I said, you know, I'm gonna do it because it's right for the environment. And I'm in no rush. I left like an hour early. And so I made that choice, and it wasn't easy, right? I mean, you know, it was work, I rode my bike here, it was hot, I was sweating, but I'm fine. And I made a choice, and I actually saved, if I was to calculate the amount of pollution that I, pollution I did put into the atmosphere, it's pretty significant, because every pound of carbon you put into the atmosphere from that coming out of the exhaust of your car contributes to global warming, which contributes to sea level rise, which directly affects us on your day-to-day -day life here on Key Biscayne. So individual choices can go a long way. My other big thing, I'm going to talk about this spiel, is plastic water bottles and single-use plastic as terrible. Right, terrible, right? So these things, you know, and I know Jimmy's going to talk about recycling, but these are all called single-use plastic, and you use them one time and you throw them away. We don't think anything about it, right? They're benign. But in actuality, they really aren't benign. You have a choice to not buy these, because these actually are quite damaging to the environment. Do you remember we talked about the recycling, or maybe not the ability to recycling some of these things. Um, you don't have a water bottle. Right there. You do? To my left. Oh, this one. The crushed water bottle, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, water bottles is another thing. We, we generate millions and millions of these bottles. People don't think about the environmental impact. But the point is you have a choice individually to move away from these things that actually do have a benefit in the long term. Um, so I'm going to go back to water. So residential water use for your own individual uh, efforts. This is a typical chart of household water use. Most water use is in the bathroom. It's the toilet, the faucet, and the shower. It's about 60% of your water use in your home is in the bathroom. Um, you flush toilets, you take multiple showers in the day, how many times you put your faucet on and leave it running. As a matter of fact, I was in, I went into the bathroom here and I couldn't believe it. A faucet was running. So I left the faucet on. I was like, ah! Oh! And so it would be great if they had the, um, the sensors. The sensors are great because you put your hand under the water goes on and you move away and it shuts off. But that's a manual, so if somebody forgets to turn it off, it just keeps on running. So anyway, we focus, the county really focuses on, on the bathroom uh, of people's homes. So we provide rebates, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, for you to incentivize you to go out and buy these high efficiency fixtures that'll help you reduce your water use. We also have a great um, landscape program. If you guys have a yard, a house with an uh, in-ground sprinkler system, we have rebates about, uh, that help you put in a more flora-friendly yard that reduces your water use. You can probably get rid of a lot of those sprinklers. You don't need them. And so all this is part of our water conservation program that I was talking about that the county has developed to make it a more sustainable 
uh, county and make our water resources last well to the future. Um, so these are the incentives I'm going to talk about. So we have um, toilet, faucet, and showerhead fixtures. They're really commonly available now in Home Depot and Lowe's and all plumbing supply stores. If anybody lives in a home, regardless of being a condo or a single family home that was built before 1996, you automatically qualify. You can get $50 for putting in a high efficiency toilet, $25 each for a faucet and a shower head. If you know any seniors that have the, uh, senior, prop the senior exemption on their property taxes, uh, usually it's an income limit that you're allowed. We'll even give you more money back for that. And it applies to all different types of homes, single family, multifamily. We even we can reach out to hotels and motels. And as I mentioned, we have a senior program. You can receive, receive up to $200 on a rebate for the purchase and installation of a high efficiency toilet. Um, and then um, we do a free shower head exchange. If you have old shower heads in your home, you don't feel like going out and buying a new one, we'll actually give you new high, high efficiency shower heads for free in exchange for those old ones. We do that with single family homes, multi-family homes, with lodging facilities. And we also provide, big thing, leaks in a home. Leaks are huge. People don't realize Sometimes you hear that toilet running in the background and you just kind of ignore it. Well, that thing is running 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. You're paying for that water that's leaking out of that toilet. We have a simple dye tablet that you drop into the tank, wait 10 or 15 minutes, it turns the water blue. If you lift the lid of your toilet and the water is blue in your toilet bowl, that means you have a leak, a leak from the tank to the toilet, and you need to get that fixed because you're wasting that water. So we give those out for free. Let me know, come to the customer service center, we'll do that. Uh, we have swivel spray kitchen aerators and all this other material so that you, it's a high efficiency um, head for your oh. kitchen faucet. If you have an older home, you can take off the old um, aerator that they have and replace this new one and it's a high efficiency model. So we give all these things out for free. So the county really is great about helping people conserve water. We, we have quite a lot of incentives. So we've been really working hard. For, for the last 10 years, we've had this water conservation program in effect and we saved about 15 million gallons of water per day as a result of the conservation program. And most of it has been reaching out to the community and providing these people incentives to change out their fixtures in their bathrooms, since that's the biggest user of water in your home. Uh, let's see, so, and that's all indoor water. Outdoor water use is another whole element. Uh, did, 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 uh, did some people say you live in a single family home here in Key Biscayne? Yeah, so, I mean, you don't really irrigate your yard that much. But if you do irrigate your yard, usually you have a timer that the sprinkler system automatically goes on, and that uses a huge quantity of water. So we have a whole outdoor water conservation program geared towards people who have yards with an in-ground irriga uh, irrigation system. We provide money back. We'll actually, the county will actually send staff out to your home for free, assess your yard, give you a list of recommendations that tell you what, how you can make your, water, your yard more water efficient, and then they just leave. They say it's up to you. If you want to implement them, we'll actually give you money back for doing it. There's no obligation. We'll come out for free. We'll do it. We'll give you the list of recommendations. They'll tell you how much money you can get back if you implement those recommendations. And then it's up to you to do it. But it's a great program. If you know anybody who has a home, that, uh, and there's no limit on the year of the house. It could be a brand new home. It could be an old home. Let, us, let me know. Give them my name, and I'll send them information about the program. Uh, and then what can you do? Very simple things. Some of them sound silly, but they actually are effective, such as not leaving the water, the faucet running when you're brushing your teeth. It sounds like a child's <laughs> statement, but you know, it's amazing how many adults that do it. I, <laughs> it's hilarious. So I work in the water and sewer department. Everybody knows I'm the water conservation guy. And I go into the kitchen at lunchtime, and we have a, a sink. And you wouldn't believe how many people they'll be washing, and then they'll, they'll, they'll leave the water running, and then they'll go into the to the refrigerator, up in the refrigerator, and, and they'll leave the water running. And I'm like, what are you doing? Just turn it off. And they look at me like, oh, come on. And I go, it's just as simple. But you know, people just, we take it for granted. We have this incredible resource. It honestly really isn't that expensive. If you look at all of your bills in a month, your water bill is probably the cheapest thing you have. But meanwhile, it's probably the most important thing. And um, so we take it for granted. But a lot of places in the world do not have this. Have you, have you guys, are you familiar with the story about Cape Town, South Africa? Yeah. Right. So Cape Town, South Africa, which is a big city in South Africa, they are reaching ground zero, day zero, of no water. The city is running out of water, period. And what that means is that people will literally wake up that day, put their faucet on, and no water will come out. 
And the only way they can get water is if they take jugs and bring it to a center and fill the jugs up and bring the jugs home and use them. I mean, that's just amazing. Can you imagine how important water would become if that's our situation? So we're not in that situation, which is great, but it's important to think of that because it is a limited resource and we should treat the resource well. Um, you know, reduce your shower time to five or 10 minutes. Just be more conscious of how long you're in there. You know, turn the water off when you're lathering up the sun and let it run all the time. Uh, you know, install the high efficiency fixtures that I just told you about. That's a great way to save water. By the way, um, the toilet, an old water wasting toilet that were put in homes prior to 1996, they use between five to seven gallons per flush. A new high efficiency toilet only uses 1.28 gallons. So that's a significant savings. My, my, I had the old new ones put in 1992, and they only used 1.2. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. So that was so, so that was, that was in 1992. Yeah. So 1992, the the federal government passed the um, the the uh, Energy Act, and part of the Energy Act was the requirement of water efficient fixtures. So manufacturers started making these toilets mm -hmm. from 1992 on. It just took a really long time for the big box stores to get them. It took them a while to get the manufacturing going up. So you were very lucky that they installed a high efficiency fixture back then. Most people don't have that. So that's why we have this 19, we give up to 1996. Any home built before 96 qualifies. Um, a water wasting shower head uses five gallons of water per minute, but a high efficiency shower head only uses 1.5 gallons per minute. So, so just by not necessarily saving water, just by using water, but using the high efficiency fixtures, you'll actually save a significant amount of water. Was, one thing you're missing from the indoors is also turn off the faucet while you're brushing your teeth. And exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah. And that's such a common thing. People do that all the time. It's just, we just don't think about it. We just let the water run. Um, and it's so funny because, you know, part of my, uh, my job is to go out to students, to young kids, and kids are great. They are way better than adults. Yeah. They totally, they're like sponges, they absorb it, and they'll tell me, oh yeah, I tell my mom and dad all the time, turn the faucet off in the red, I go, that's great, you know, and then the mother and father are like, oh, you're annoying. <laughs> so, but it, you know, it's, kids are great, you know, they really take what you say, and they actually implement it. The adults are harder, we're slower, you know, we get set in our ways, you know, we, we have a tendency to, you know, be resistant to change, but it's just being conscious of it, you know? Just like me this morning, I could have taken the car, I said, let me take my bike, you know, you think about it, instead of taking your car to the store, can you walk to the store instead? Is it that far? You know, the plastic bags, instead of using the plastic bags they give you at the store, you know, bring your reusable bag with you. It's exercise too. That's exactly right. And so my belief is if you implement these things into your lifestyle, just make it part of your lifestyle, you start to do it and you don't even think twice about it, and then you get the benefit of the exercise, which is fantastic. Your doctor will love it. Um, <laughs> And then the outdoors, you know, uh, like I said, for anybody who has a, a yard outside, we'll come out for free and assess your yard, give you recommendations, get rid of that grass. Grass is the worst. Grass loves water, it loves water. And if you don't water it after a few days, it looks really bad. So the best thing is to get rid of it and plant awesome Florida-friendly plants. They have so many beautiful plants that are native to Florida, that are flowering, that stay green all year round. They're butterfly attractors, and, and that's really the way to go. Um, and then, you know, an expensive thing to do, to do your home. Yeah, you I mean if you have somebody come in and to, yeah. right, so, so this is the, 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 the cost benefit, right? Yeah. So if you have a very big yard, a lot of people in, in Miami have these big, beautiful, green, all grass yards, that's a challenge. You have to do it all at one time. So what we do, the landscape rebate program is we'll give for single family homes up to $500 per year for five years to change their yard. So this way, you don't have to do it all at one time. Do it slowly, incrementally, year by year, have a plan of what you want to take out and put in, and just do it over a five year period. Because it is expensive to do it all at one time. And if you hire a landscape contractor, it will be expensive, yes. no doubt. And that's why we have this five year program. Uh, for, for large properties such as HOAs or um, large condominium buildings and hotels, We'll actually give them up to twenty eight hundred dollars uh, a one time rebate to redo their yards. So that's a pretty significant amount of money, two thousand eight hundred fifty dollars. So it's a great program. I cut my own grass, so you, know, you cut your own grass. I do. That's great. It's good exercise. It's a great right. exercise. I ride my bike. I don't drive my car on the key. That's excellent. Yeah, well, that's see one thing about it's nice about living in a place like Key Biscayne is 
it's kind of a, it's an enclosed community, meaning everything yes. is somewhat close by. You don't have to go all the way to Miami to go to the food store. Yeah. And so there's no reason why you can't walk, because nothing's really that far. So it's just a matter of changing your mindset, though, because um, many people just think, what am I going to get in the car? It's yeah. awfully hard to walk because it is. you're slower. But I it find that on my bike, at least got weak knees. <laughs> right. And you get there faster, so you don't and sweat I, as I'm much. I'm down <laughs> in the supermarket, which is air conditioning. Right, right. And yeah. then I get home, and then, of course, often have to have showers if you're out too long. Right, know, so that's right. A All right, topic. but you can take a five-minute shower. You get in and get out really quick, you know? I'm not, I, I don't have the shower on all the time. I, 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 you lather up and turn the water. I tell that people all the time. They look at me like I'm yes. crazy. Five minutes, no. there's no way. I go, listen, you if you go into the shower and you get yourself wet, and then turn the water off and then lather up, and then turn the water back on and rinse off, you may be in the shower for 20 minutes because you do your hair, you do your body, but you probably have only used five minutes worth of water. Yeah. And that's what I'm talking about. I don't care how long you're in the actual shower. It's how long do you have the water on. And if you turn it off and on when you're lathering up, that's a great idea. You save a lot of water. I do love a bath every so often <laughs> to relax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, you know, it's not, you know, you don't have to always do these things. It's just to be conscious yes, of them. Conscious. And, you know, I'm a believer in moderation. You know, you take that luxury bath on occasion, that's fine. Yes. But for the most part, if you're taking a, a quick shower and you turn the water off, yes. that's fantastic. Unfortunately, a lot of people are very wasteful. They go into the shower for literally 30 minutes and they leave that water running the whole time. And that's what I'm trying to educate people about. Stop doing that, you know. Uh, let's see, what else? Yeah, so that's some ideas in indoors and outdoor use. And so as a utility, my job is to educate people about the do's and don'ts of how you should be treating your water use and why you shouldn't be flushing down your toilet because it directly impacts the utility and can, can, can increase our costs, our operations costs. So does anybody know what these things are already? This, this is up here? Right, it's a baby wipe. So how many people, well now I wouldn't even call them baby wipes. We, now we just call them wipes because adults love them. Yeah. How many people use them? And don't be shy, because I have them. Yeah. No. Okay, right. They don't throw it in the soup. Right, so the problem is, is that people love putting these in the toilet. And what happens is, they do not break down. So if you were to take a baby, a wipe, and put it into a bowl of water and take the same quantity of toilet paper, and put it into a bowl of water and shake the water, literally in five minutes the toilet paper will dissipate and it'll break down. That baby wipe will not break down. And so what happens is that it gets caught up in our systems. And when people flush them down the toilet, they get into our water, wastewater treatment plant and they clog the system. And we have to manually go in with a rake and remove them. This is what we get. We get blobs of baby wipes. Globs and globs of it. And unfortunately, it can't be digested in our process. They have to be physically removed. And we remove them and send them to the landfill. So they co it costs us a lot of money. And we're trying to keep our water rates down. So my job is to ask you, please do not throw baby wipes into the toilet. Just keep a garbage can next to your toilet and put them into the garbage can, please, if you can. Because it just helps us a lot. Uh, we shouldn't be treating our toilets like a trash can. Unfortunately, some people do. So another thing, just being conscious about it, keeping a garbage can in your, in your bathroom and putting things into the garbage that aren't appropriate for the toilet. Um, and that's the only thing you should be pushing down, flushing down your toilet, is nice, white, fluffy toilet paper. Not the baby. Not the, yeah, not the baby, keep the baby. She's adorable. <laughs> just the toilet paper. All right, and so now my, and my, my last part is to educate you about our high quality water. So keep a stain gets water from Miami-Dade Water and Sewer Department. We are the provider of water to you. How many people drink bottled water in this room? Nobody drinks bottled water? This is amazing, <laughs> amazing. So none of you are guilty of buying bottled water. No. Wow, this is a very educated group of people. Because when I go to Costco and Walmart and Target, all I see are people walking out with cases and cases of bottled water. And I always crack up because you know most people are buying it thinking that it's better, better quality of water. And a lot of it is marketing that they've been convinced that that's what it is. But what's interesting is that a lot of times people will buy the, um, they'll buy like the, the Costco brand, or the, they call it Kirkland, for example, or uh, whatever brand Walmart has. And most people don't realize that those brands are, is actually city water that's been bottled. It's actually yeah. municipal water that they just <laughs> maybe filter one more time and they'll put it into a bottle yeah. and sell it to you for about a thousand percent more than if you were to fill this bottle up at your tap. 
So I'm here to tell you that Miami Dade water is excellent high quality water. You can literally drink the water from your tap. That's how good quality it is. Now, some people may have an issue with the taste, and honestly, a simple filter will resolve that issue. And I understand that because our system is so big, it's such a huge system, so depending on where you are in the distribution system, the length of time the water is in the pipe, it can affect the taste of the water, even though it's perfectly safe. And so what I tell people is just to get a simple filter and put it on your faucet in the kitchen, or if you have a refrigerator that has a, a bottle of water filter, use the water from there, and that usually will eliminate any issue with the taste. So um, we test the our water thousands of times a year. We have to meet or exceed federal and state standards. Bottled water companies, I don't know if you know, but they do not have to meet federal standards like we have to. They actually test their water, but they're not obligated to report their findings. So every year, if you're a homeowner here in Miami-Dade County, every year you receive a water quality report from Miami-Dade Water and Sewer yes. listing all the parameters that we test for and what the levels that we see. And we're supposed to shut down the system if we exceed any of those parameters. So you can be really feel very secure to know that our water is tasted, tasted, tested many, many times during the year to make sure that we uh, have a limited number of pollutants and we don't exceed any levels. So, but you know, anybody, everybody here seems to not drink bottled water, which is fantastic. But if you know anybody who does, you know, buy them as a gift a reusable water bottle and tell them a story about bottled water, that it's, it's actually a facade. There's a big marketing ploy that goes on. This is Zephyr Hills. Does anybody know where Zephyr Hills is located? Yeah. Yeah, it's in Florida. It's in Central Florida. And um, does anybody have any idea where their water comes from? That they bought it? Yeah. From us. From you. <laughs> so it comes from the same sources, for the most part, Miami Dade water. It comes from an aquifer. Up, up there in Central Florida, it's called the Florida. And uh, down here, it's called the Biscayne. So it's the exact same source of water. And they're just putting a really fancy label on it and marketing it to make it look like it's just really yeah, ultra pure source all, of water. There's also a report out recently that I read about toxins coming from that plastic bottle into right. the water. Right, right. Yeah, and, I, and I, I usually go on and on about the spiel, but I'm going to cut it short. But that's a really good point. Yeah. So the big problem with these bottles. These are, if you, if you ever buy a bottle of water, you might notice that the plastic's really flimsy, yeah. right? So the idea is you should only drink them once yeah. and then throw it away. That's called single use. Recycle. And the reason why they do, recycle, right. And the problem with, uh, with this plastic, and the reason why they only want you to use it one time, is because this is a very poor quality plastic, and it contains certain chemicals that if you were to use the bottle over again, or if you would leave it in a warm location, those chemicals can leach into the water and obviously over time can build up in your body and have some detrimental effects on your body. So they call that single-use plastic. That's actually very common, unfortunately. And, uh, and then what's the other environmental issue? So when you use it one time, what do you do? You throw it away, throw it away right? And where do these end up? Jean Marie's gonna have an awesome presentation, <laughs> but outside of Miami-Dade County, where do most of these bottles end up? Worldwide. 30% the of them end up 30% of them end up not being recycled. Mm -hmm. A large majority of those end up in a landfill, which they'll take hundreds of thousands of years to break down. Or they end up in the ocean, or in the street, or someplace you don't want, they shouldn't be. The other day, there was a wheel that was found with 19 yes. very plastic sad. in its belly. And, and you know, that's a, not an ice, you know, you might think that's an isolated incident, but it's actually not. More and more plastics are being dumped out into the ocean and we are, remember I was talking about your individual responsibility and individual choice? Well, this is an example of an individual choice that you can not do because you know it's not the right thing to do. Get a reusable plastic bottle, a reusable aluminum bottle, stainless steel, and use that and fill it up over and over again, and you move away from this altogether. It's a shame what's happened there, yeah. So, um, so that's my spiel about my native water, how delicious it is. There's a great article in the New York Times, this is going back to 2016, um, about the impact of plastic bottles on the planet. It was mind-boggling. Do you know that just within this country, 49 billion plastic bottles were purchased just in the United States alone. That was, that was in 2015. It's actually gone up even since then. So where are all those bottles going? It's just mind-boggling. And the amount of oil that's used to make plastic, the amount of pollution that's created from making that plastic. And then they're shipping the bottles all over the world, and all that oil that's being used to ship the bottles. And, and then you use it, drink it one time, and throw it away. It's a very wasteful process. Um, so there's some great factoids that were in this article. There have been other articles since then. Actually, there was an article not long ago in the Times 
Uh, they were talking about this, have you guys heard the Pacific gyre of, yeah. the, of plastic? So there's a, uh, what happens is that when plastics get dumped into the ocean, the ocean have these set patterns of currents. Oh, yeah. And so what happens over time, all the plastics start congregating in one area from the yes. currents all come together. Yeah. And it literally circles in the middle of the ocean, in the Pacific Ocean. There's a huge patch that, it's mind boggling the quantity of plastic that's there. And what's happening is that a lot of it's not, not visible from the surface anymore because the plastic started to break down. And so it's floating in the water column just below the surface. And so that's getting into our system. Fish are eating the plastic, which in turn then we eat the fish. So uh, it's, it's a shame with, with the buildup of plastics becoming so much more common. And so as an individual, you can make those choices to try to move away from your plastic as much as possible. Once again, it's impossible to reduce to eliminate 100% of your plastic use, it's just be conscious. You know, when you go to the store, don't buy the apples that are packaged in the plastic and the plastic that, wrap and the, that you know. Get people to find anything that isn't in plastic. Yeah, it becomes more challenging. More more. But maybe buy the, the apples that are in one plastic bag because at least it's that much less plastic than buying the packaged ones. Uh, you know, little things like that really can make a difference and that's an individual choice. Okay, uh, that's a... Oh, you don't need, you don't, I mean, you guys, you, know, you live in Key Spain. you have Key Biscayne, so you have beautiful beaches here, but these are pictures of beaches elsewhere in the country and in the world that plastics have become the scourge, it just keeps on washing up on the shoreline. Okay, and um, that's it. Does anybody have any other questions for me? Where do you get the information about the landscaping? Oh, okay, uh, yeah, I can give that information to you. So, I don't have a business card with me, but I can get a pen and paper and give you my email address. And you just shoot me, or you give me your email address, okay. and I'll email you the information. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll have a slide at the end that has all of our contact information on, so you can reach us if you have any other questions, but you can do it now. <laughs> so Patrick was talking about the water half of the water energy nexus, so we're going to kind of switch gears and talk about more about energy and energy usage in your home. So we'll start big picture. He touched on you know climate change. It's a big buzzword that everybody talks about now, and I'm just going to mention you know, on a simple level, global warming, because we do know that's actually happening. And if anybody's not familiar on how global warming works, is that the sun emits energy onto the earth, and part of that energy is absorbed by the surface, and the other part is reflected back up into space. So when we introduce greenhouse gases into our atmosphere, which is located here, that traps that reflected heat, and it increases the temperature. So when we're talking about um, energy usage, why do we care about greenhouse gases? And it's because um, energy production is one of the biggest contributors to greenhouse gases. So if you're making conscious decisions to reduce your energy usage in your everyday life, you're going to res be responsible for emitting fewer greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And so if you couple greenhouse gases, I'm sure big, everyone knows CO2, that's the big one that everybody talks about, you know, has to deal with you know, production and transportation. Some others that you may not be familiar with, um, water vapor is a naturally occurring greenhouse gas, but when, as the planet's getting hotter, more water is evaporating and that's creating more greenhouse gases and increasing the temperature and it's just a vicious cycle that we have going on. So here you can see that the production of electricity accounts for at least a third of the greenhouse gases. So if you can at least you know, reduce your electricity usage, and like Patrick mentioned, you know, use your transportation less as for walking and biking, you're gonna be making a difference as far as how much greenhouse gases you're uh, emitting into the atmosphere. Um, so this is just a little correlation graphic on temperature versus uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Um, so you can see the patterns are pretty similar. You have CO2 concentrations on the left and the temperature on the right. And they look pretty similar up until, you know, a certain point, like 1800, they, you see a big spike in both. You know what could be contributed to that, that all of a sudden all the CO2 was put into the atmosphere at that time? The industrial revolution. Exactly, the Industrial Revolution. So that's when we really started vamping up our production and burning a lot of coal. And so that put out a bunch of CO2 in the atmosphere and it correlates with the temperature as well. And so this is just a nice little graphic to give you an idea of the temperature change in the last few decades that you can see now that pretty much, and this is already even five years old, that there's pretty much no blue anywhere. And that that's been replaced with yellows, reds, and oranges. So pretty daunting when you see it in a graphic like that. So Patrick touched on it, but why do we care about global warming and climate change down here? One of the biggest ones is sea level rise because we have so many people and infrastructure in low-lying areas that are susceptible to that. 
So at the end of the day, that's gonna you know cost us a lot of money to to deal with sea level rise. So if we can make efforts now to help mitigate climate change and sea level rise, that's gonna save us money later on. We talked about some ways that you can save water in your house. So we'll switch gears and talk about uh, how you can save energy. Um, one of the biggest things is your AC unit that probably sucks up the most energy in your home. We're running that thing pretty much year round. There's maybe like a week in February where you're not running it, but pretty much that's running year round. So if you're, you know, every year you get it maintenance and you change that filter out every month, you're gonna about save about 20% in your electricity bill. And so again, reducing your greenhouse gases and saving water as well. Um, another thing to think about, I don't know if anybody uses a programmable thermostat in their home, but that's something very simple that you can do to update your thermostat so that you can set the temperature. So when you're not home, you're not you know, cooling your house for anybody. That's kind of a waste of electricity if nobody's home. You don't need to keep it at a lower temperature. So the programmable thermostat allows you to set that. You can say at five o'clock when I come home from work, now it's gonna be the comfortable temperature that I want it to be. Versus when I'm at home, where I'm not at home, FPO recommends that you, you know, bump up that temperature to about 79, 80 degrees, just to save on electricity that way. Another thing that you can do is switch out your light bulbs. You can switch out your light bulbs from traditional um, incandescent and CFLs to LED bulbs. They're really energy efficient and they last about 25,000 hours versus the CFL bulbs, which only last 8,000. So it's a big it's a big difference and they last that much longer and they're not that much difference in price anymore. So those are some things to think about and of course, you know, you know, running your machines, your washer and your dryer, you know, at full capacity. Um, just simple things that you can do to, to make those changes. So just to help you with that, at the end of this um, presentation, everyone's gonna get a little kit to help you, you know, start this journey right away. And so we include um, a couple new light bulbs that you can use and implement into your home now. Um, Patrick had mentioned the water efficient shower head. You'll each be getting one of those. So you can install those in your homes right away. You'll be getting a reusable water bottle. And then usually the, the favorite item is everyone will be getting a little shower timer. <laughs> so Patrick mentioned five minutes. This is five minutes. So take it home and see where you're actually at. How many times you have to flip it before you're done in your shower. So I think yeah, now we'll have Jean Marie come up oh, to talk okay. about recycling. Can you press the buttons for me? Yeah. Okay. Hi, good afternoon. Anybody have a blue cart like this one over here at your house? Yes. Yes? Oh, excellent. Okay, then you are going to love the information I have for you today. Um, I don't know if you remember, but um, before 2008, we had what was called the dual stream program, where everybody had two little bins, and you took the bins to the curb every week. Well, in 2008, we changed to something called single stream, where all of your recyclable material can go into one cart, and you can just wheel it to the curb every other week. And we're using um, automated side-loading trucks. We delivered 350,000 carts in this program that first uh, started in February 2008. And by December, we had them all delivered. It was the most amazing thing I have ever participated in. It was one of those exhilarating and terrifying things that you do in your life. Um, but it was great, so everybody got a cart. Um, it was so great that we doubled the amount of material we pick up. Um, you can see this little tree here because, you know, just we put that in there to show you that we're saving trees. Uh, but, but it was so easy to uh, recycle that we literally doubled the amount of material that we were picking up. And that has caused some other problems that I'm going to get to in a second. But I want to tell you this early in the program. This is what is called a materials recovery facility. This is where your recyclables go so they can be separated and then shipped to companies that make new materials out of them. I show this right away because there's usually someone in the audience that says, I don't know why you bother because everything goes to the landfill anyway. Well, that is not true. If you put the right materials in your cart, those materials get recycled. Now, I can't help you with the wrong stuff that goes in the cart, and that's a big problem. But the right stuff, and we have signs here to tell you what the right stuff is, those materials do get recycled. And the idea is um, uh, aluminum cans become new aluminum cans, steel becomes new steel products, the plastics become carpet, carpet backing, and a bunch of other things. So. Um, and the paper, of course, becomes new paper. 
All right, and this just is kind of an idea of how many tons of materials and so on and so forth, but we're gonna speed through because we've got really good stuff. The whole idea about recycling, just like you've been hearing today, is by recycling these items, you're saving energy. And if you're saving energy, what else are you saving? Have you guys been listening? Yell it right out. If you're saving energy, you're saving? Water. Yes, exactly, water, which is, which is fantastic. Yes. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, this is the most important part. This, this is why I have come here. Um, we have found out, we have done a recycling composition study. We just finished a few months ago. You are not going to believe this. More than 30% of the stuff you put in the blue cart is not recyclable. It is not. It consists of the most amazingly bad things. I am talking about shoes, pillows, um, comforters, sheets. I, I don't understand. And let me tell you, a recycling truck is exactly like a garbage truck, only it has recycling in it. But all the stuff you put in that has a little bit of liquid in it, you know, all that stuff comes out. So think of that pillow that that guy put in gets in the recycling truck and it absorbs all that icky stuff that's in the truck and then they dump it out of the recycling plant. It could never be used again. It's disgusting. So uh, it, it's called wishful recycling. People put stuff in and they think, oh, someone can use this. I wish it could be recycled. And they put it in. It can't be recycled. It makes a mess at the recycling plant and it's going to end up causing huge problems in the future. So we're going to stick to the items that are recyclable, which of course, as we all know, are aluminum food and beverage containers. Fantastic. Making an aluminum can from an old aluminum can saves so much energy and water, you can't imagine it. Because instead of mining the bauxite, putting it on the ship, transporting it to another continent, uh, working at it so it can become aluminum and then making it into a can, you can just think of the energy. So, or you can melt this down and make a new can. So, excellent for recycling. Um, we've been talking a little bit about glass. Clear brown and green glass is acceptable in our program. Um, glass, believe it or not, well glass is getting thinner because it's heavy. It's heavy to transport stuff in glass, but it is still part of our, our recycling program. It's okay to, um, to recycle. Plastics. Okay, here's the hard part. The only plastics, and you're not going to believe this, that are acceptable in this program are bottles. We say narrow necks, but that's kind of hard to understand, so I'm telling you now. Plastic bottles. Think bottles. Anything else that's made out of plastic that is not a bottle is not acceptable in the program. So this is good. These are good. This is fine, although you should be using tap water, but, um, but that's it. Nothing else. We'll get into the nose in a second. Um, aseptic and um, able top. Oh, steel. Sorry about that. Uh, steel cans. Steel cans are great. You understand that. Great. Becomes more steel. Put that in. Aseptic gable cup top containers, excellent for recycling. Actually, this is high grade paper that um, has a little thing of plastic around it, easy to recycle. So we want these. The Tropicana people love us. Um, there, there's um, a fabric softener that comes in this kind. There's soup. All of that is great for recycling. You can put that in. Then we get into the papers. Okay, so we have newspapers. Yes. Anybody here get a newspaper besides me? Yeah, excellent. Lots of places they don't. Fabulous for recycling. This used to be 60% of our recyclable materials. It's like 10% now. Um, being online now. Right, exactly. Right, right. And um, as an aside, the computers you're reading them on are not recyclable in the program. Um, okay, you can, can, can you bring that somewhere though? You can't yes, practice electronics. I'm so glad you asked that. I have to keep a scan to recycle it. You have electronics yeah. recycling? Yeah. That's yes. great. Excellent. Because there's actually a lot of computer that can't recycle. Yeah. Oh, no, definitely, but not in the blue. But not in right. the blue. Right. right. <laughs> Magazines, catalogs, excellent for recycling. We really love it. Um, this is the most fun part. 
Does anybody here know what this is? You guys know, right? I went to a, um, it, was, it was a third grade class, and this was hysterical, so I hold this up and I say, does anybody know what this is? And they're going, no. I said, in the old days, you could open the book, and you don't remember Mrs. Brown's phone number, so you could look up Mrs. Brown and get her phone number to give her a call. And one of the kids said, ew, that's creepy. <laughs> and I said, oh, but you could ask to have it unlisted. <laughs> but anyway, we don't have these anymore. This used to be a huge, huge recyclable material. We would put out roll-off containers to get these to recycle. But anyway, if you have one and it's not historical uh, and you want to recycle it, you certainly can. Uh, corrugated cardboard, excellent for recycling. Um, as I said, the newspaper has gone down unbelievably. Um, thank you, Lord, for Amazon because we have a lot of corrugated boxes. However, you have to break them down. Do not get, I don't know, a washing machine? Well, maybe even something smaller than that. Uh, a, a large box, and then you come over to your cart, and you like put it in, and you try to cram it down as hard as you can, and you know, it's like this, because that, that's not going to work. So break it down. That would be great. Um, oh, junk mail, office paper, great for recycling. We love that. And then my favorite, cereal boxes. And the reason cereal boxes are my favorite is because it's not just cereal boxes. It's like every kind of box that's in your house. This is all wonderful. This is called paperboard. Excellent for recycling. So very good. So these are all the good things. Um, yeah, here's another one. Even this, that's good. Okay, so now let's go on to press the button so I can say what is not recycled. Let me tell you, this is the worst thing you can put in your recycling cart. This actually disables the equipment at the recycling facility. Do we have? Yes, okay. Okay, so at the recycling facility, there's miles and miles of conveyors and different kinds of conveyors, not just flat con conveyors that you normally see. But this is called a star screen. And these are all plastic bags. They have to shut down the plant every two hours, just turn the equipment off, and they have to get up on here, the workers, and dig this out with knives. It's unbelievable because, you know, it keeps, I don't know if you can see this. This is the uh, wrapping, like that yellow. Oh, yeah, that's really bad. So, and of course, this stuff is hot too, so it's melted on there, and it's just, it is the worst thing. Now, so, yes. you're saying this, what, how, how is that happening? Or, like, in other words, when when the recycles are collect, recyclables are collected, mm -hmm. people are putting their recyclables in a plastic bag. Oh, they're, they're just putting here. the bags in. Oh, they're just putting the they're bags in. They're just putting the bags in. And then, they're putting their materials in plastic bags. Which is now it's you know, possible that that stuff bumps along and doesn't get get wrapped here. Although it probably does because you know how bags <laughs> are. They right, but. There's no way to know what's in a bag, and people actually put garbage bags in their recycling as well. So when the workers see a plastic bag filled with something come along, that it gets dumped. So it does not get recycled. Any, any recyclables in that plastic bag is gone. Dumped. So it's right. the sole purpose of it. Right. But thank you. Judy, let me ask you this. When we put our garbage out, we use garbage bags right. to go in the garbage. Right. What happens when it gets to the plant and you say, okay, do, do they take the stuff out? Well, it, it's, it's garbage, garbage and it's in a garbage bag and it's in your garbage cart. Uh -huh. It goes to the garbage facility. Yeah, that's what I mean. That's what okay. I'm talking about. And, oh, and there, it, um, no, because it, no, in Miami-Dade County, we have a waste to energy plant. Mm -hmm. So that material is just picked up with a crane and goes right into the boiler. So it, yeah. I so. mean, you can you can return like public stuff. Oh, all this stuff can go to public. And they recycle. Well, that's correct. That's and what I was saying. You should get the reusable bags. You right. 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 But, but I, I but use public, those for a garbage bag. Right. You can sometimes. use them as a garbage Which, you know, bag. Reduce, at least reduce, it's recycle. Being reused, yeah. 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 But Publix can recycle them because. They are not separating anything out, out from those. What's in those little containers should be plastic or plastic bags. So that, that's why, because a lot of times people say, well, why can they do it and you can't? 
Because they don't have a materials recovery facility. It just goes right in. Yeah. What about the foams then? Right. Okay. These are also. The I mean, eggs and. Yeah, styrofoam. styrofoam. Not acceptable in our program. But they can be recycled. They in yes. And they actually, and they take the tray, like if you get yeah, those trays. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, they'll take they'll the take styrofoam tray. Yes. No. Yeah. yeah. All styrofoam. Right. But Publix is the only one. Well, the are they have the good time. Time. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, and the other thing, so no, no plastic bags, no materials in plastic bags. And um, the, this is like so important that I want you to actually repeat after me so that nobody will forget. No plastic bags in the cart. No plastic, plastic bags, bags in the cart. Okay, thank you. On this side, no <laughs> plastic, plastic bags, bags in, in the, the cart. cart. Okay, thank you, thank you. And Jimmy, can I just make one yes. comment? So they have you have a picture of a light bulb. That's great. Right. That's a that's a high efficiency light bulb. A CFL. Okay, and that you're going to get today in the kit that we're handing out. Mm -hmm. We're giving out those bulbs. Those are CFLs. Right. Problem with those, they actually contain mercury. Mm -hmm. right. So when those yes. stop working, yeah. you should recycle them. Do not put them in the garbage. Yeah. Will so they take them here? Yeah, across the station. Up at the okay. yeah, So the, you know the old incandescent bulbs? Are yeah. you familiar with those? Those mm -hmm. ones that are so hot you can't touch? It's okay with those in the garbage. Garbage, also yeah. not in the recycling. They're okay for the yeah, garbage. garbage. But the CFLs are not okay for garbage. Correct. And by the way, the county, which hasn't been mentioned, we have an exchange program. If you have any old incandescent bulbs, mm -hmm. bring them in and we'll give you new CFL bulbs in replacement. There's a high uh, water, high energy conserving bulbs, and eventually we're going to move away from CFLs and go to LED. Mm -hmm. LED are the best, because there's no mercury in them, they're even more efficient than CFLs. Right. But just keep that in mind, the incandescents you can throw in the garbage, but those you should not. There's mercury in them. And you want to get them recycled. Thank you. Excellent. That's really true. Um, no non-recyclable plastics. So, what would be a non-recyclable plastic? Anything that um, isn't a bottle. That's a lot. <laughs> See, that's all single-use plastic, which is really bad. Okay, these are not a bottle. This is not acceptable for recycling. So, I'm, and I'm so sorry, and people get very upset, but the only materials that are plastic that are acceptable for recycling are bottles. But we don't want you to buy water bottles. No. Right? No. So we no. want you to but reduce see, your use. But here you go. Good. <laughs> Excellent. So, yeah. But, but you wouldn't believe. Um, the other things that are, are unbelievable that are in the cart, I mean, I'm telling you, 30% is not recyclable. Construction and demolition debris. I, I drive along on recycling day. I see two by fours sticking up out yeah. of the cart. Palm fronds. I have a picture. I should probably update this and give you some pictures. Sure, of, yeah, yeah. There is, I have a picture of what looks like a palm tree growing out of a cart. Yeah. It's just someone cleaned up and there was so much palm tree all the time. Part you should grow and keep skiing. I know, I know. So well, they actually, put those. In the garbage. That's, That's garbage. That is not recyclable. You know, the, the, there should be actually so garbage police. There really should be. <laughs> no, it's it's funny. Funny. no, 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 I no, yes. um, I think uh, I've heard this come up before, but I just wanted to check because I don't remember. What about the pizza boxes? Excellent. Uh, we're getting to that. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And um, pizza boxes. Yeah. Oh, that's that's cardboard. cardboard. No, but no, oh my gosh, this is great. Well. So tell me, um, tell me why you think maybe pizza boxes might not be acceptable. The because of the pizza cheese. Yes, the grease, basically, the grease. And I, I tell the kids when, when I speak to them, I say, you know, you can do a great science project. Take some oil, just a little bit, and pour it on here, and just leave it. I mean, keep the ants away, but just keep watching it every day. And it will just get bigger, the spot will get bigger and bigger and bigger until it just... So now you figure, here we are at the materials recovery facility, the recycling facility, and so all the cardboard goes into a baler, and you have a great big bale, lots and lots of pizza boxes and other cardboard, and where does that go? Well, it goes on a ship, and it, mostly everything, 
has been sold to China because they make everything, right? But they've stopped taking our garbage. They've stopped taking. Well, <laughs> it's recycling. not. It's our recycling, except it had a lot of garbage in it, so you were right. So now it's on the ship. It's on the ship for, you know, a couple of weeks. I don't know how long it takes to get there. Uh, three weeks, whatever, now it goes in the port. And so now this bale has been absorbing this oil and absorbing, and you've got a big mushy bale of nothing. So, so pizza boxes, and I, there's always a few people. My pizza boxes are not greasy. Well, you've been gypped, number one. <laughs> and, um, and basically, if it tastes good, throw the box away because it is not good for recycling. So yeah, pizza boxes have become, and um, someone even showed me a picture of a pizza box that says, recycle this box on your back, oh my God. So yeah, so not, not educated. I know. Well, but you know, these are like if kind of. If it wasn't used, you could recycle it. Right. It's right. Clean, but yes. When food gets on there. Right. Like Once it, yeah. And so yeah. So the people who make pizzas really, you know, they don't take their clean boxes and put them out. Right. 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 So yes. All right. Um, no hangers. Uh, hangers are really bad because um, if, if you think the plastic bags get caught, hangers get caught. You know, it's even worse than hangers. Christmas lights. Oh, very, very bad. And worse than that are hoses. You would not believe how many people want to put a hose. Again, it's, um, I don't know, it's, it's wishful recycling, and it goes in, and that wraps around. So all these, they're called tanglers. Any kind of tangler you can think of, don't put it in the recycling. All right, we go back. Okay, um, have I missed anything? I don't think so. I've told you all this stuff. Okay, so. Do you have a question? Yes. So, um, Thank you. This is to, in regards to the contamination of right. the foods on the cardboard, okay. should we be cleaning out our containers? Yeah. What? Like the Tropic Attic, should we be washing those out before we put them in? I don't want anybody, funny you should ask that. <laughs> I don't want anybody to waste water. Um, if it's dry, you would think that once it's dry, it's good. So if there's a way to give it a swish, fine. Um, use that water on your plants. But otherwise, as long as it's dry, chunks of food or bag, that, you know, in the car. So like a, if I had an old tomato can, I should probably rinse it out and take all the tomatoes that would be, out. Oh. That would be better. Because you right? don't really hear that? Like, I know. I, I try not to that. say that when you're here. But yes, when you don't aren't with me, I always tell people. No, that's okay. Clean, no, no, that's kidding. a sense of being That's not wasting water. That's being sensitive. Yeah. And, and really, we're not asking you, you, don't put it in the dishwasher. I've done that. Don't do that because the labels come off. Don't ever have to take the labels off. But um, yeah, give it a little swish and, and let it go. That's, that's really good. Um, home chemical collection. We have two. Well, you have something on Kibis Kane. Um, but we also have Miami. We don't have home chemicals. Only one seat. Oh, no, we don't have. OK. So Miami-Dade County has two yeah. home chemical collection sites that are open to all residents of Miami-Dade County. Whether you live in a house, if you live in an apartment, if you live on a boat, it doesn't matter if you're a Miami-Dade County resident. You can bring paint, you can bring um, pool chemicals, any kind of uh, uh, chemicals, uh, household, any, chemicals. The household chemicals that you see here. Fluorescent bulbs, CFLs. Um, if you come from a place that does not take your old computers, we will take them. So these are all the things that we do not want in the garbage or the recycling. People ask me about batteries. Okay, um, A, AA, AAA, C, and D no longer contain mercury. So you can actually put them in the garbage, not the recycling, the garbage. Um, but anything else, the lithium batteries, the button batteries, the hearing aid batteries, the batteries from your cell phone, um, none of those are good for garbage or recycling. Bring them back to our home chemical collection sites. Okay, and so these are just reminders um, about the, the recycling program and uh, residents can place all of their recyclables in the blue cart. Make sure your cart is at the curb by 7 a.m. on recycling day because even if the truck has come by at 11 o'clock for the last 10 years, the day you put your car down at 10.30 will be the day that a new person is on that route and is starting at your house at 7 a.m. And then you call and say, gee, Marie, they missed me. So do that. Uh, collection for this program is every other week. You can sign up for alerts, um, which we will actually text. Well, we will email you the night before and tell you to put your card out. We mail out calendars annually in December. I work very hard on that. 
And um, we also want to remind you to keep your cart at least five feet from your other cart or your mailbox or a car or anything because people think that the truck comes up to the cart and stops gently, putting the arms down, opening up, and gently touching the cart, <laughs> lifting it, and tapping it into the top of the truck. Then just as gently replacing it on the ground, opening up the arms, and then goes on to the next cart. But in real life, the truck comes up like this. <laughs> If you have a green card here, it's down the block. If you had a mailbox here, you won't be getting your mail for a while. So just remember five feet apart is really good. And thank you, and any questions, I'll be glad to ask. Yes. Tell me when this supposedly officer is supposed to be right. Okay, you no, know, I keep his cane. I am not sure, because this is not the curbside recycling program. But, um, I mean, you have a different program here. No, but did you, yeah, did you but come in, in here on recycling? Can, can you call on somebody? Or? I'm sure you can. Oh, but listen, you can call them everybody. Let, let uh, me tell you, we have had such an issue. We have started a blitz in, in not incorporated. And we were going to different areas. And on the day of, of the route, they are, they are not following the truck. They are preceding the truck. And they are coming along. And, and those cards that you saw that are open with all kinds of crazy things, they're putting a yellow tag on it that said advisory. Notice your card will not be emptied until you take X out of it. You know whatever the materials but are. I thought, listen, and uh, and, and my and my speed know, alone, it's hard. I know. The, the people put the the ball it's is falling out of the side. It's wishful, and you know what? This it's is no. not just a problem here. This is a problem nationally. Everyone is having this problem. I mean, ten but years. How do these people read? Well. I don't know. I think part of it, there's like different groups. This is what they found. They found like 75% um, of the population thinks recycling is great. And of that 75%, another 60% think they're recycling fantastically. They don't need to learn a single thing because they know it. So it's hard to teach someone something they think they already know. But believe me, we mail out stuff. We have, uh, we have bus. We've, we've plastered the side of buses telling I, you to recycle this. I have offered to do work free for, for the garbage people. I yeah. don't keep saying <laughs> yeah. I work free. Because you know, our garbage men, I have lo the loveliest garbage men oh, ever. I love garbage men. Can I tell you, they are wonderful. They are. Oh, they're great. Two weeks ago, one of them was telling me, he said, Mr. Sakura, come and see what just I just oh. picked up. It was an engine of a car. Yeah. Yeah, it was I in crazy. the recycle, oh and half of it was broken up and half of it wasn't. And you know what happened? And these men, are, these men are, are human beings and they're treated like they, trash. I know, it's awful. Yeah. Well, you know, that would have been a little bit for the president who was being lazy. Instead well, of bringing it to the right location. No, yeah. 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 But I would think that they could bring it like an engine you would bring to that, uh, yeah. I guess, a certain location, right? Yeah, it has oil in it. I'd definitely bring it to yeah. a chemical. But, but, but you know how much hard that would have been for him to have done that? He had to drive all yeah. the way to Doral. Yeah. Right. I agree. No, oh. but I'm saying, and that's what he probably just said, yeah, just put it there and take care of it. No, but it's, it's, it's but that's not, not right. Yeah. No, but it, 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 what's happening, in Wednesdays you now, where we have a recycling nursery, right? And I, I live in a house, so I see what was oil. We have one man some days uh -huh. in the state. Now, if that car, we've got one man who just doesn't pick up your stuff, if it's overflowing, he just leaves it. Right. He will not pick it up. And I agree, I think that's the yeah. best thing ever. But some days I've got to bring in another guy with him to get the stuff out of the, the, the trash it's can. So, it's so much. The truck because there's so much. There's so much. And people don't even care. I mean, they don't even recognize that these are human beings that are doing that. Oh, without a doubt. That is so they true. They treat them like trash. Really true. If they were being and, penalized and financially, they'd change. That's what they should do. Yes. Green bands, they call the yeah. bands. Sometimes, you know, a, I, not often, sometimes I've forgotten it's the day to be. Oh, there. yeah. yeah. And you know, oh, they've come right out. Yeah, that's nice. Oh. That's really nice. Does anybody else have a question? I, 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 I,
Yeah. Touch the south for not the big ring, but at the same time. I that was nice. That was, that was really nice. Yes, ma'am. Um, when you're throwing stuff in the recycling bin, right? Um, does it all just have to be loose? I mean, I know you don't want to contain obviously in a plastic bag, right. but does it have to just all be loose? It's best because if it is. I mean, like I wouldn't put it in a box, or I wouldn't tie it. What I do is because it's easier for me is in my kitchen. I have like a paper bag, right? And I'll fill it up with recycling oh, okay. and then take it out at once and dump that. Whole yeah. Thing in there. The and the paper bag is good because that is recyclable. It would probably be better if you dump no, it out. Once it gets in the truck, it kind of moves around, but it, it would just be better if it's if it's loose. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That just says recycle. Right, but so they are not <laughs> telling you the uh, truth. Uh, <laughs> and that's single <laughs> use. So they, 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 they have the shoe. Oh, okay. The shoe, and then they have a uh, thing. Right, the containers. Right. And they tell you to throw everything that's recyclable in that one. Thing. Right, as long as it's acceptable they, in the material. Yeah, but how do they? At the materials recovery facility with all the conveyor belts, it's like a, 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 a magnet pulls out the steel. And so it knows that machinery knows that this is. A, well, yeah, because magnets I attract don't, I don't steel. I always feel curious throwing to like yeah. the, the. But it, it's okay to do that as long as it's acceptable in the program. That As long as it's a bottle, can, or paper. And anything else, it's garbage. Garbage. Bottle, can, paper, otherwise it's garbage. Yes. And all your aseptic is. All right, well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.